Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch of the Wesley and William Janeway Institute for Economics. And I want to warmly welcome our guests of honor, my friends, Wesley and Bill. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers and the panelists taking part in our virtual round table. As with so much of life nowadays, blending the physical and the virtual makes it possible to enrich this event with participation from around the globe. And I'm very pleased that you all could join us. In 2012, the Cambridge INET Institute was founded thanks to major philanthropic investment from the Institute for New Economic Thinking, or INET, a nonprofit New York City-based think tank which Bill co-founded. The global financial crisis had revealed such serious cracks in the system that many were left wondering what had gone wrong, as well as when and how. INET's support enabled the Faculty of Economics to bring its long tradition of frontier thinking to bear on its investigations of the issues that were shaping the modern economy. Cambridge INET has since distinguished itself at every turn and become a hub for researchers across disciplines. It's fostered the discussion of new topics in unexpected ways, discarding traditional boundaries. Thanks to Wesley and Bill's generosity, the Institute's important work will now continue long into the future. The new Janeway Institute for Economics will invest in shaping young minds, transforming economic research, and disseminating its findings at Cambridge and far beyond. I'm deeply grateful for Wesley and Bill's generosity and vision in helping to maintain the university's leadership in new economic thinking. As you all know, Bill has a close and long-standing relationship with Pembroke College and the Faculty of Economics, where he completed his PhD. The extraordinary scope of Wesley and Bill's involvement across the whole collegiate university has significantly benefited a wide range of students and programs. Among many other distinctions, they're members of the Guild of Cambridge Benefactors, and in 2009, they were jointly awarded the Chancellor's 800th Anniversary Medal for Outstanding Philanthropy. Bill has continued to serve first on the board of Cambridge in America and still today on the Campaign Advisory Board where I treasure his deep experience and wisdom. I'm delighted and very grateful that the, uh, the Institute will continue in their name and I can simply think of no better fit. New and evolving economic questions will always be with us, Brexit, COVID-19, the climate crisis, indeed, whether we'll find petrol when we next pull up at the pumps, all spell changes, large and small, to the way we live. Economic thought must deal with these and many other issues as it grapples with unexpected developments, unruly complications, and the least predictable of all variables, humans. A complex world demands research and solutions that are above all flexible and agile. Flexibility has been one of Cambridge INET's strengths. For example, the postdoctoral research program has allowed young researchers the freedom to pursue their own research interests while integrating into a wider multi multidisciplinary set of research groups. Thanks to the endowment of the new institute, this unique and powerful agility and responsiveness can develop further. Research will be able to reflect issues as they arise. New directions might include inequality, climate change, epidemics, gender, the digital economy, or the impact of automation and machine learning. The Janeway Institute is partner to one of the most venerable and storied economic departments in the world. Now it will help us tell new stories, advance research frontiers in economics, and shape the international narrative of our economic future. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Wesley, for your generosity. Please join me now in welcoming Bill to say a few words. 
Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you very, very much. Um, as the Vice Chancellor said, it's almost exactly <clears throat> 50 years ago that I received my doctorate from the Cambridge Faculty of Economics. I'd written my thesis, and you'll see why this is relevant, on the formulation of economic policy from 1929 to 31. My supervisor was Richard Kahn, and I was in a faculty that was then peopled by a generation that included Joan Robinson, Nikki Kaldor, uh, Piero Sraffa, and many others of great distinction. Those four years leading up to that dissertation being accepted <clears throat> changed my life. From that thesis and from the experience of interacting with those economists, I took away three lessons, three lessons that are deeply, deeply ingrained in my brain. The first, the interdependence, the complex interactive interdependence of the financial system and the real economy, and how that complex set <clears throat> of evolving, uh, never stable uh, dynamics induce a certain kind of systemic fragility that one must always be on the outlook for. As all participants in markets, in policy formulation, necessarily operate under conditions of more or less radical uncertainty with respect to what the full consequences of their decisions will prove to be. Well, I took those lessons on a 35-year sabbatical. Uh, I took them to a world in which any ability to make a dent on the real economy is critically dependent on access to finance and the terms on which that access is available. A world in which all efforts are subject to existential uncertainty of an extreme kind and where fragility is very much a way of life. That is the world of venture capital. Now, in the late 1990s, it happened that one of the most extreme uh, moments of the intersection of the dynamics of the financial system, of the stock market, and the venture capital's efforts to induce and drive change in the real economy reached a, a maximum. And at that point, I did recall the work I'd done on 1929. So in 1999, I could say to myself and my partners, you know, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. Thank you, Cambridge. Thank you very much. And that's where, if you like, the notion of giving back really began to take, to take shape. Some few years later, Wesley and I established residence here in Cambridge. We did so just in time for the global financial crisis to validate in extreme those lessons I'd learned studying the world of 90 years ago from 50 years ago. The crisis represented a kind of binary challenge. Was it a threat to one's work, one's life, one's ways of thinking? Or was it an extraordinary opportunity, opening up channels and dimensions of research? And it turned out, which is not going to surprise anybody here, that there was a critical mass of people in the Cambridge Economics faculty who did see it as an opportunity. And over the course of some years, beginning first with an event that I discovered while I was living in Cambridge in a full page advertisement in the Financial Times, that a new outfit that I'd never heard of called the Institute for New Economic Thinking was going to have a launch event at King's College Cambridge. And it listed the founding members of the board, among whom was a chairman named Anatole Koletsky, who I'm delighted to say is sitting right here, and whom I'd known in his journalistic, his super high-end journalism on economics and finance. For some years, I got in touch with Anatole, who in turn introduced me to Rob Johnson, the president of INET, 
uh, with whom I had a conversation that continues now a decade later uh, about the challenges and the opportunities of how the economic and financial world had evolved for the discipline of economics. So I became engaged with INET and very early on realized that as INET was working to establish leverage in the discipline and on the discipline, that Cambridge represented a remarkable venue, a remarkable place. I began a conversation, I introduced, I should say, the then chair of the faculty, Hamid Zaburian, to Rob Johnson. And over the course of, I would say it must have been about 18 months, I may stand corrected by one or more of the people in this room, the faculty did something which some might find astonishing. It reached a consensus on research priorities and themes, which took the form of a document, an extended document, a proposal to INET, which I reread today. And it identified four principal areas where Cambridge had something distinctive to bring to the table that was relevant to the challenges generated by the global financial crisis. To be specific, a theme on networks, crowds, and markets, yes indeed, led by Sanjeev Goyal. The transmission mechanisms through which economic policy impact the real economy, Giancarlo Corsetti was the leader of, of that initiative. Information, uncertainty, incentives, the microeconomics that really went behind the facade of behavioral economics where Hamid Saburian and Chris Harris had been doing extraordinary work for years. And then drawing on the, I really might say, unique history of Cambridge in econometrics, going back to Richard Stone, the empirical analysis of financial markets that Oliver Linton led through the development of this program and has led since with enormous distinction. So Cambridge INET was established on the basis of that proposal embedded in the faculty. And that was really important because over this now almost decade, it's been an engine of innovative thinking, as the vice chancellor said, for bringing visitors to Cambridge, bringing postdocs, and then for a host of conferences, publications, reaching out from Cambridge to the world bringing Cambridge back into the top level of discussion as economics continues to evolve. Cambridge INET has prospered under three successively successful directors, initially Sanjeev Goyal, then Giancarlo Corsetti, and now Vasco Carvalho, who I'm just so thrilled is leading and overseeing and driving the passage from Cambridge INET to the new Institute, a renewed engine for creative research, endowed in perpetuity to carry on and extend the work of Cambridge INET and to allow for continued evolution, both intellectually and institutionally, within Cambridge and for economics in the world. And with that, I would call on Professor Leonard. Tim, I, wait a second. Yes, it's Tim Harper, the head of the school. Uh, I'm delighted uh, as head of the School of the Humanities and Social Sciences to be here to celebrate the launch of the Wesley and William Janeway uh, Institute for Economics. Through Wesley and Bill's generosity, programs begun under the Cambridge INET Institute will continue to flourish and to grow in new directions. This is also, as the Vice Chancellor has said, a transformative initiative for the entire Faculty of Economics, of which Bill has been an active member now for many years, as it constantly seeks to renew itself and through its research contribute to global understandings of change and uncertainty. Not only is this a timely initiative, it is an urgent need. Led in no small measure by the Cambridge INET, the faculty is committed to making its research more swiftly available. The Institute's webinars, working papers, podcasts, and research videos have championed outreach in innovative ways. 
This has been especially important during COVID times of getting relevant research findings, for example, on COVID supply disruptions, capital flow, household spending, the changing labour market, all out to the widest possible audience. This sense of urgency is also in evident in the institution's investment in postdoctoral researchers. The support of emerging talent, particularly of younger scholars under these difficult conditions, I know is a key aspiration for Bill and Wesley. By this, and by bringing both senior and early career visitors to Cambridge, the Institute will make a crucial commitment to renewing the field, to sustaining global mobility of ideas and talent at a challenging moment for both. And above all, an encouraging research work that anticipates new futures. The School of the Humanities and Social Sciences is a large assemblage of research institutions. It is home to 10 faculties and departments whose research ranges from the deep history of humanity to the most immediate public policy concerns. The school teaches around 30% of the university's undergraduates and half of its taught master's students. It hosts the flourishing constellation of research centres and two museums. Hallmarks of all this work are a global approach to research in key areas such as history and heritage, governance, sustainability and inequality, and a constant challenge to intellectual boundaries. But within this constellation, the new Janeway Institute will be central to our strategic ambitions to facilitate and expand interdisciplinary research into challenging new areas, particularly at the interstices of economics, law, public policy and digital science, and of ensuring its global impact. As an historian, I'm especially excited by plans at the interface of economics and history Bill, after all, as he's just reminded us, began his own research career as an economic historian, and so we historians can claim him as one of our own. Fruitful conversations are already underway, for example, in the use of big data that stresses the importance of perspectives over the long historical duration. I know interdisciplinarity is a guiding theme of Wesley's own scientific work and wide societal commitments. The new Janeway Institute will impact right across the humanities and social science disciplines. It is a tremendous opportunity for us all in Cambridge. I salute Bill and Wesley's most generous and far-sighted vision. It is a privilege to mark the formal opening of the Institute and to anticipate its exciting future. Good afternoon, and good evening, good morning, depends on where you all are at the moment. As chair of the faculty, I'm absolutely delighted of today's inauguration of the Wesley and William Genoway Institute. The Genoway Institute is and will always be a key pillar of the research, education, and impact activities of the Faculty of Economics here at Cambridge. And we are deeply grateful to Wesley and Bill for their amazing support, help, and for making this available possible. Indeed, we are confident that the Genoa Institute, building on the past 10 years of the Cambridge INET, will provide the incentives and support within the faculty to address the greatest questions in economics by exploring them in order to identify not the most popular answer, but the most careful answer, to use Morishima terminology. By helping us nurture the next generation of researcher and postdoc, and by making sure we address key issues that have certainly considerably expanded in recent time, starting from understanding, as Bill mentioned, the most recent economic crisis, the consequence of a devastating pandemic, the effect of certain political decision, Brexit is the biggest that comes to mind at this stage, and the need to address key and potentially devastating challenges, first, uh, first among all, climate change. All these goals will be achieved by the existing teams of the Institute, spanning from macroeconomics to finance, from networks to game theory, from international trade to econometrics. We are also confident that in the near future, this team will evolve so as to be able to address new and upcoming questions. Indeed, 
we are building on the work and support of the Institute in exploring the research question which are the, are the boundaries of disciplines such as economic and finance. And uh, um, one of the key mission of the Institute, as was clarified by Bill, and the economics and data science, one of the newest challenge, both in terms of research and education within the faculty. It is the support and the dynamics and product the research environment of the Janeway Institute that is going to make this research and education agenda possible. And there is no other way to say this but to acknowledge that we will forever be indebted to Wesley and Bill for their support, incredible help in pushing and moving us in these directions. And on this, without further ado, let me now leave the screen and the floor to the director of the Genoa Institute, Professor Vasco Carvalho. Unlike the other speakers, I'm gonna have a few slides. Uh, just because you've been hearing these buzzwords of what we wanna be, an international hub, um, uh, continued investment in the next generation of researchers and, and a place to produce frontier research. So I wanna convince you and reassure you that there is a lot of continuity in those statements and there is change. So the continuity for, for everyone listening at home, for, for the generations of alumni of Cambridge, you will notice and you will know that Cambridge Economics was never the faculty, which is individual members and atomized researchers. It was a hub, and it, all, it will be a hub, and it was always a hub. So I couldn't resist, and please ignore the first few lines, but this is a, a letter from Joan Robinson to Bob Solow. And I want to draw your attention to the familiarity of the last phrase. I would not be so unkind if you would not be so pig-headed. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you in 1961. Sincerely, John. This is brought about by familiarity, not by individual peddling of your latest paper or your latest idea, but about being with people, discussing, knowing, having the confidence to, to acknowledge the fact that you don't know what you're saying, that the other person is don't, doesn't know what they're saying. The second, and we'll have an example in a panel, is the long tradition of nurturing and investing in the next generation of researchers. So we'll hear from Joe Stiglitz, and Joe Stiglitz started a career at Cambridge in a college in what we would today probably call a postdoc. Uh, Joe is one of the many examples in the profession of people that passed by, that were integrated, that interacted, and that maintained close links to Cambridge throughout. And this is what the January Institute will keep on doing. And he has always been a cacophonous, a, ca a chaotic, a plural research environment. Um, that is kind of always sometimes orthodoxy, sometimes the heterodoxy, sometimes the leader, sometimes the follower, but always pushing to redefining research frontier and be, make economics relevant. And that's what we're here to do. Um, this puts it in long, uh, opens a very long lens, a very big lens onto the role of the collegiate university, but also the role of Keynes and Stone, Department of Applied Economics, where I started a research as a research assistant. Uh, say hi to Andrew Harvey online. Um, this mantle was taken over by Cambridge Inet in many ways. So what Cambridge Inet did was pick up each of these and reinvigorate economics at Cambridge and reinvigorate its interactions with the world. So as the last director of Cambridge Inet, I just want to put some numbers on the board. You'll be able to read them. You know, econ economists are suck at accounting. So they are broadly correct to the <laughs> To, the, to, to what, plus or minus 2%, probably. Um, but what, what this has done is revitalize the faculty, revitalize conversations within the faculty and with the faculty to the outside world, to have a constant flow of people uh, across the sciences, across the globe, across scenes, and, 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 in, and then pass on this to a next generation of researchers and, in the end, output that into working papers, into conferences, into discussions, into impact, into ref case studies, into real world uh, discussions. 
Uh, and with that, I should pause and, and, and actually take a moment to, to, think, to thank all the partners of Cambridge Island. Either New York, of course, but also the Keynes Fund, SURF, uh, Mohammed al Aryan and Cape Queens College, the Isaac Newton Trust, and of course the Faculty of Economics. And in particular, some people that need to be thanked uh, by name, apart from Bill and Wesley, of course, uh, Hamid for his role in bringing Cambridge Inet or, uh, to, to fruition, Sanjeev as the initial director, Giancarlo Corsetti as the follow on director. And coordinators that are many are in the room, and that's all I'll just mention the ones that we not that have moved on, uh, like Professor Hamish Lowe, Kaivan Moshi, Kuntolings. And thank everyone, uh, not the least Rob Johnson back in New York, the advisory and the management. So this is shopkeeping, but the important shopkeeping, because this is the life and blood of many hours of trying to develop a research environment that is exciting and that is outward looking. And with that, um, and I should not forget the staff, past and present, including Marion and Anna that put all this together. Um, with that, what are we gonna be doing? We're gonna be doing cross-cutting research. Um, we, we, we are obsessed with uh, themes that cross across, cut across the usual silos of macro, micro, econometrics, and try to, to, to join up researchers both inside the faculty, across Cambridge, and across the world, and across disciplines, to understand you know, what does it mean to be an individual in an interconnected society? What does it mean to understand aggregate outcomes in a world that is built up from all the, the interaction of these micro units, and how does macroeconomics come about in that world? Um, what, ha what do you do when you have trillions of data points? Fundamentally, technically, how do you make sense of the world uh, of a data-rich environment? And thinking always back to fundamentals and to the foundations of economics in the sense of what is human choice, what is human behavior, what is information, what is learning, what is incentive. Um, we are already advertising for the next generation of Janeway Institute postdocs. We are continuing to commit uh, uh, resources to the PhD program at Cambridge. Uh, we're we will remain outward looking and fostering interactions uh, through many, many different ways. And I think as, the, as someone has said, I think that the big difference, uh, certainly with the latest stages of the DAE and Cambridge Inet itself, is that this is no longer a grant. This is an endowment in perpetuity. And what endowments in perpetuity allow is that they are not connected to individuals or fleeting research agendas or they allow you to renew and to address new questions. So we're trying to build up uh, to, to kind of meet that novel flexibility that the endowment allows by, by having inbuilt mechanisms that propitiate continuous change, that has input from externals, that has oversight uh, by external advisory boards, and also seeking new partners and continuously seeking new directions. And that means through grants, through joint ventures like the Bennett Institute, like the collaboration with the Bennett Institute that we just started last year, uh, through donations, enlargement of endowment. All of those are a continued uh, process of injecting resources to open up new initiatives, new dialogue, and new themes that reflect both Cambridge-based economists' evolving strengths, but also societal concerns at large. And with that, I'll leave you to explore the website I'll leave you to explore Twitter, and I'll leave you to take a break, and we'll come back for a panel discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We're going to cap off the, the, the official launch with a panel. Uh, given the day and age, we are uh, doing this virtually and reaching to friends around the globe. Uh, we'll have with us Professor Ellen Ray from the London Business School. We'll have uh, Professor Yun Song Shin from uh, currently at the BIS, and Professor Joseph Stiglitz at Columbia. Um, Professor Antoinette Schuer had a last minute problem. She sent a video, so she will engage, still engage in the discussion, though she will obviously not be there for Q&A after that. Uh, uh, a welcome to our panelists from Cambridge. Hope all is well. 
Thank you for coming, Ellen. Thank you for coming, Yun. And thank you for coming, Joe. Uh, we'll get started, and we'll get started by um, showing you what Ellen, what Antoinette had meant to say, and then we're going to go to Ellen. Um, then we're going to go to Joseph Stiglitz, and then to Yun Chin. That will be a first round of remarks by each of them. We will then try to get the conversation going, and finally we'll open up for Q&A for people in the room, maybe for people outside. Uh, so should we start with Antoinette's uh, remarks that were prepared for the occasion? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Antoinette Shoa. I'm delighted to speak to you today. I want to talk to you about how the 2008 financial crisis affected the field of economics and finance, and also whether we are doing a better job at contributing to the social good. Um, as all of you are obviously aware, um, there was a lot of discontent about economics and finance after 2008, and a lot of people felt that we must be either out of touch or not caring at all about real problems in economics. Um, so some of that might have been a bit unjustified because people often don't understand how academics work. But by and large, it is very much true that we had little to say about the actual solutions or policy implementations um, leading up to the crisis. Um, and I think more broadly, we often have not focused necessarily on the topics that are of most important um, to say um, policy impl implementations or issues of financial inclusion, regulatory uh, regulations of abusive practices in economics and finance, and just building financial capabilities, especially at the bottom, you know, kind of um, of the pyramid of the people that are the most fragile um, within the economy. And you might ask, you know, where does this kind of research gap come from? And I actually myself have asked that question um, a lot. And I think um, what happens in social science, since it's still a relatively young field, is that originally we were basically organized around individual contributions and rewarding um, novelty of ideas and new channels and basically um, uh, new ideas, um, but less focused on, say, um, providing ultimate solutions to complex and multidimensional problems. And I think the more economics and finance become a, um, a more mature field, it should go in the direction where engineering and the natural science have already gone, which is um, to have a feedback loop between academia and the real world that makes actually academia better by getting constant feedback from the real world and then obviously um, has impact um, on the real world. And I think um, you can see that some of this is happening. So if you focus on you know, what has changed since 2008, I would say there is a set of direct impact where the crisis affected what people work on. So for example, um, a lot of, especially financial economists now work on basically um, what people like to call the plumbing of finance, meaning really trying to understand the institutional context in which, say, mortgage market or OGC markets, et cetera, work, and what impact this has on actual financial solutions. Um, in addition, we've seen that actually the crisis opened up a lot of new research on measuring expectation and people's beliefs and also the formation of beliefs using surveys, um, using basically uh, a whole variety of new tools that previously were a little bit looked down upon by economists, but we realized how important this aspect of, um, of financial markets is. And I feel what we've also seen that actually through the crisis, this interchange between um, regulators, policymakers, the real world, and academia has become much tighter and are so much more rewarded for um, academics. And you can see uh, my distinguished co-panelists all have done both, right? They have been 
um, influential on the real world side and also obviously outstanding economists. And I think, you know, this is a very good trend that, that is becoming um, uh, much more accepted. I also think that the, the 2008 crisis actually accelerated a number of long run trends, which I think are very good ones. Um, in particular, um, there's a long run trend, trend towards economics and finance becoming an ever more empirical science. Um, we have seen that the credibility revolution and the use of field experiments has really transformed applied microempirics and finance and policy evaluation. So um, here I want to again congratulate the winners of this year's Nobel Prize. Um, but also the, um, the spread of big data and AI um, is very much affecting research on financial markets, on household finance, and holds promise for macro and IO and other fields um, of economics for sure as well. And I think this overall emphasis on more precise measurement and taking measurement serious is, is very important. I remember when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, Jim Hackman always used to say that economists are so obsessed with looking smart that they will rather write a model of empirical relationships than just going and measuring them in the real world. So I think you know it's, it's good that we have gone beyond our biases and, and are embracing measurement. Now the organizers, of this event asked me to think about um, you know, some of the things that I um, fear have not fully been addressed or that keep me up at night. And I would say um, the one first order thing I would pick is that, um, that there is still, if you want a research market failure on some of the most pro pressing social problems in finance and economics. Um, and these are often areas where private incentives of scientists might not necessarily be aligned with social goals. So some of these are basically topics um, where there might not be an immediate crisis that draws everybody's attention um, and maybe not much money gets spent on it, um, nor even regulatory efforts spent on it, but that need long-term solutions and that need innovations. Some of this really is the regulation of abusive practices, financial inclusion, um, how to deal with um, people that are financially more fragile in a world of, say, algorithmic finance that creates more and more actually separation of types um, rather than pooling um, in the economy. And I, I feel you know, there's a lot to do um, on these topics. So in my own work, I have tried to bridge this by starting a nonprofit that really applies tools from academia, from economics, psychology, behavioral economics in the real world. Um, and we call this organization Ideas 42. Um, and why 42, right? This was inspired by Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if you remember, right? Um, the computer is asked, what is the meaning of life, the universe and everything? And after calculating for many hundreds of years, um, it comes up with 42, because basically, if the question is stupid, the answer cannot be meaningful. And I think, you know, what we have learned basically is the same is true for research. If we're not getting immersed in the actual problems, we cannot ask good questions and then find good answers. So I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is this. This planet Earth has, or rather had a problem, which was this. Most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much most of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of them were largely concerned with the movement of small green pieces of papers, which was odd because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. So, you know, <laughs> let's ask the real questions and hopefully we will have real impact um, on the social good. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you again to Antoinette for that. Hélène, can you hear us OK? Welcome to the panel. Absolutely. Can you hear me OK? I think we can. Uh, so I think it's time for, I think, I think you were going to share some slides with us or some presentation. Um, yeah. thinking about international finance and climate. And there we go. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. So first, I have to say I'm delighted to take part in this launch event. It's a neighboring institute, so I'm hoping I will be enjoying the interactions being based in London. Um, so glad to, uh, to participate here. Uh, and there are lots of, you know, important topics one could talk about and important things one can talk about. I think um, Antoinette already uh, said that uh, since 2008, there has been quite a few uh, rethinking in the profession on the number of, uh, of issues and, uh, and topics. Um, however, I mean, it would be also wrong, as she pointed out, to say that, you know, we didn't do any... <laughs> any relevant work before the before 2008 that's absolutely uh, that would be absolutely uh, false I mean and uh, some people on this panel have uh, contributed a lot to the style of work the type of work that is now uh, absolutely front and center in terms of imper market imperfections various types of frictions uh, that we uh, now put a lot more in our macroeconomics model, in our financial economics model. So there is a lot here um, that we already knew and that we are learning uh, even more these days. Um, but so I think, uh, given my background in international economics, I thought I would, uh, I would focus on uh, interdependence uh, because I think it's a, it's a, very, uh, it's a very interesting and uh, possibly uh, under-researched area. And I think we, are, we have both seen a lot of progress in the, in the recent years, but we also can look forward and think of all the issues that we should be probably thinking about because they are first order and, uh, and we have not really uh, done a lot of research um, on, on, those, uh, on those issues. So let me first point out that in international economics, uh, we have had, uh, you know, uh, you have used for quite a while, uh, very important models uh, that I'm here put under the uh, Mondelian paradigm type of models to think about interdependence of countries, of different currency areas, where we are focused a lot on um, uh, current account balances, uh, foreign exchange rates in uh, various types of models, international trade, and look at uh, the effect of various, uh, of various shocks in that, in that context and how they propagate across countries and how we can think about joint co-movements of countries uh, within these, uh, this style of models. Uh, more recently, and this has followed in a way the world economy, um, I think we, we are seeing a lot more models which think about, uh, about production network, about global value chains. And there has been a lot of theoretical, very interesting theoretical work about rethinking the production functions uh, in various uh, theoretical settings with various types of frictions and how we can, uh, we can think about the boundary of the firms and how we can think about uh, global value chains internationally. And I think this is uh, extremely important. And of course, it has been illustrated firsthand with the COVID shock recently, where we are, we are in the middle of it. It's, um, it's front and center. So I think uh, a lot of this research is very welcome and there, there's a lot more to do there. Uh, and on the financial side, uh, which is more on uh, the stuff I was, I've been contributing, um, there I think we also learned a lot in terms of financial market imperfection, risk taking, and propagation of, um, of shocks via uh, movements in risk premia, and how they are affected by uh, the international financial institutions, how they are affected by uh, uh, monetary policy of various countries. And I think this type of international propagation was missing from the more classic paradigm because there was not enough focus on these uh, frictions in financial markets uh, that are extremely important for international capital flows. And here I'm thinking in terms of gross capital flows and international financial transactions, maybe more than uh, you know, net, uh, net flows and, uh, and, and the net uh, uh, trade balance uh, that we are more used to. Um, uh, to modeling uh, in, our, in our traditional models. Uh, so there's, there has been quite a lot uh, in that area, but uh, I think one, one thing that uh, I, I always find quite fascinating uh, for me as a researcher is when I look indeed at those linkages in the world in terms of these different levels I just discussed. So I just talked about the trade network, I just talked about the financial network, but what do they look like? Do they overlap? And uh, in fact, when you, when you look at these different types of interdependencies, these different types of networks, you realize that they look very different. So here, this is um, 
a very simple network graph based on value added trade. And you can see the various countries, if they are big, it means they have a lot of um, imports and exports with the rest of the world, it's proportional the size to the average exports and imports. And we obviously see that uh, there is a multipolar world out there with the US, China and, and Europe, which is here disaggregated in the gray little areas, but aggregated would be the, would be the third node. And then we have a lot of other countries gravitating around those three big nodes. But that's what the international uh, economy looks like and the interdependence look like if we look at, at trade measured by value added. If we look at, uh, at trade measured by exports, uh, which with more countries here, uh, we see something a bit similar. We see the US, China, and we see Europe also, which is big. And then we see a few more countries because there's more data here, but more or less it, it gives the same style of picture. But now if we start to look more in terms of production network, um, there we see that in the international economy, yes, there's the US, there's China, and there's still Europe, but Germany becomes a little bit more important in that, in that network. And, and we see that it has a bit of a central role in terms of, uh, of production uh, with the other European countries. So it's a bit like a hub. Yeah? And so that gives, starts to give us a, a little bit of a different flavor. But the truly different flavor comes if we actually now look at the financial network. And that's the international financial network. And here we see that uh, uh, it's completely different. Uh, the interdependence is really there's the US, the very big node, and China has kind of disappeared. It's, uh, it's not there, it's very small in international financial linkages. Um, Europe is there. Um, and um, again, if we aggregate it, we get something quite significant, but we also see here all these little countries which have these offshore centers, which seems to be very disproportionate. So I don't know if you can read, but if you could read, you could see some of these nodes which are not trivial, which are very small places like the Cayman Islands and all these things. So, um, so really uh, with these types of networks, they are all there. They, uh, they are very important for interconnections, uh, but they are, they are quite different in terms of their structure. And uh, that has quite a lot, I think, of, uh, of implications for how we model the transmission of shocks how we model the propagation of economic activity, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that we have started to explore, but I think we, we are not there yet by any means. And, and that's a very interesting um, you know, field of, uh, of further research. Equally interesting, I think, is something we will have to investigate a lot more, but we, we don't have that many models uh, yet, not many theories, are the interlinkages in terms of data. Uh, and in terms of what uh, digital currencies will bring to that picture, whether we think about private currencies and uh, or CBDCs more, more, maybe more importantly and, uh, and more interestingly. So here, why is that different? Because again, the linkages that these types of uh, new technologies, uh, so digital currencies, but the underlying data uh, linked to the transaction in those currencies and possibly to other types of technologies, these internal linkages that will be created will create all kinds of different links uh, between different countries and power relationships, et cetera, that we are not, uh, you know, imagining yet. And I think that's, that's a very, very interesting set of, uh, of questions. And of course, this also opens up um, the possibility of uh, uh, this other type of friction that not only we don't model, but we don't have much data on, which is cyber risk. Yeah? And that's a very, very different type of friction. And uh, um, this is something that seems first order uh, for the coming years. All right, so uh, within that world, something that has been uh, quite interesting to study are what central banks do, essentially, among all the questions. That's one which is interesting. And we know quite a lot about the US, and we know quite a lot about the US because we've seen it was the central node in the international financial system. But uh, I think equally important in the coming years is to understand a lot better what's going on with the ECB and the People's Bank of China, as we will see as we, we look at the other networks where uh, these other nodes are, are very important. 
Okay. Um, in terms of rethinking the role of digital currency and CBDCs, um, I think we will all need probably to revisit uh, this um, interesting typology that was uh, uh, given by Peter Cannon in particular here about the different role of, of currency and their synergies. And we are very used to thinking about that, uh, you know, for the dollar, uh, a little bit for the RMB now, for the Euro, but uh, trying to think about that in a world of CBDCs with uh, data and, um, and who is centralizing the data uh, and uh, having international currencies which are digital may make the substitution between different medium of, of payments or medium of, of, um, of store of values um, a lot higher is uh, something that has a lot of implication for financial stability uh, and uh, also for regionalization of the economy for a lot of uh, for international trade. And this is something that, you know, is in front of us, I think. Finally, and I will, um, I will finish there. Uh, I think one can safely say that one of the most under-researched area, given its importance, has been climate, climate change and biodiversity loss also. Uh, and there, I think there is so much to do, uh, first order, that it's, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of, of us are starting to, to work into too late. Uh, uh, but uh, there are lots of issues with data in terms of disclosure, in terms of geographical location of, um, of production, in terms of financial linkages, again, the type of which I, I just discussed. And there are also extremely important macroeconomic macro modeling to do, which has to do with distributional effects and GE effect, general equilibrium effects of, of climate policies and, uh, and uh, physical and transition risks. And we are, it's really you know, the beginning of all that. Uh, we, we don't have, um, I, I guess, a lot of reliable estimates even uh, these days, uh, at whether it is at the macro level or at the uh, firm level. Uh, we don't have the right measures, uh, and uh, we start to think about the general equilibrium effects, uh, but there's so much to do uh, in link with also fiscal policy and the provision of public goods, etc. cetera, that uh, I mean, it's a certainly a, a very exciting first order research agenda um, that I, uh, I'm hoping to contribute to at some point. And I will leave it there. All right. Thank you, Alain, for that presentation. Uh, so we've gone from the plumbing of financial markets and the microstructure to the global structure of risk and, and climate change as a, as a macro risk at a planetary scale. I think we're going to uh, go back to more a methodological view of the profession with Professor Joe Stiglitz. Joe, can you share your slides and take... Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to, to be here, and uh, I wish I could have been there in person. Um, and uh, uh, let me uh, congratulate you on your uh, new institute uh, uh, work that you've already been doing, and, and uh, uh, what I'm sure you will continue to do has been very, very important. I'm going to take a very high level approach. Uh, in some sense, looking at some of the more fundamental assumptions that have been at the center of uh, economics until very recently, and, and still in a large swath of economics, remain the dominant uh, assumptions, and uh, try to uh, suggest some of the ways in which um, there have been uh, important developments going away from those assumptions uh, that I think will have uh, 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 really affect uh, the making economics more relevant going forward. So uh, beginning at some of the, the basic units of analysis uh, that go into standard economics, the, 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 the household, the firm, uh, the nature of markets, and I've just highlighted on the slide three aspects of this. Uh, the standard model talked about uh, rationality of individuals who were born with uh, fixed uh, preferences. And we've moved from that kind of framework to uh, understanding uh, 
that uh, there are predictable irrationalities, even though people can be irrational, we can understand their behavior. And uh, an important second strand of, of uh, behavioral economics that I've been engaged in focuses on the social determinants of preferences. Uh, that uh, uh, we are social beings and what our beliefs and, and our, our, our preferences are affected by those around us. Uh, and we see that uh, one of the last uh, points we talked about was climate change. There is a clearly response to, uh, uh, on the part of a lot of younger people, to be more sensitive to the diet they eat. Uh, uh, we, when we have our students to dinner, we have to have a vegetarian and a vegan uh, rather than uh, the usual uh, kind of uh, 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 what we would have served 50 years ago. But this opens up possibilities for exploitation, uh, uh, possibilities of manipulation that are uh, at the center of uh, a lot of economic and political discussions today. So that's one example of the way in which we've changed uh, uh, the base, the units of analysis uh, of, uh, in economics. The second is the nature of the firm. Uh, until recently, uh, it was just assumed that firms uh, do and should maximize shareholder value. Even though Sandy Grossman and I proved in 1976 that that was not right, that shareholder value maximization did not lead to societal well being whenever there was not a complete set of error to boost securities. So today, there are a broader perspective of what the objective of uh, firms uh, ought to be, and that has highlighted the importance of corporate governance and the laws governing corporate governance. Another aspect in which uh, uh, Bill has played a very important role is the endogeneity of technology. Um, and uh, moving innovation to the center of the research agenda, I think is very important. But here, I want to emphasize the inseparability of production from learning, uh, that many of the advances are a result of learning by doing, and there's actually learning uh, by learning. Uh, and so uh, the theories that, uh, uh, don't take into account the learning that occurs uh, in the process of production really don't give a proper account of the behavior of firms. A third example, and I'm not going through, I, you know, this is, it can't be a, a comprehensive list, uh, but what I'm going through here is that markets are not competitive. It's a problem in all markets and countries, but especially in some markets and in some countries, for instance, in the United States. And here, this highlights another aspect of the importance of rules and regulation, uh, which is sometimes called the new institutional view. It's not just deep preferences and fixed technology. It's uh, how we shape the economy through, I gave an example of earlier corporate governance, but also competition laws. Um, but because these rules and regulations are set in political process, one can't separate out of uh, politics from economics. Now that brings me to uh, a second set of major changes where the standard, uh, the work in, in Aero de Brew, for instance, began focusing on models where markets were efficient. And then there are little footnotes about market failures and externalities. Now, I think these market failures and externalities are moved front and center. And uh, that's both because we are talking about issues of climate change, the pandemic has uh, made us focus on public health, um, but also there are the positive externalities associated with endogenous technology and knowledge more generally. 
So when we think of the big drivers of what we're going through, the pandemic, uh, the, um, um, uh, the crisis of 2008, uh, uh, innovation, all of them are rife with externalities. So the basic model that was prevalent in the mid 20th century, which ignored these or talked about these at the end of the semester in a course were simply wrong. We ought to think about these both from the micro perspective. For instance, whenever there is information imperfections or incomplete set of markets, markets are not efficient, there are pecuniary externalities, or from a point of view of macroeconomics, uh, the macroeconomic externalities that have gotten a lot of attention re uh, more recently. And these are especially important in financial markets in the presence of financial linkages that have already been referred to and become even more important in the presence of uh, bankruptcy where there are never uh, or essentially never a complete set of uh, uh, eritable securities. So, um, uh, recognizing that these uh, externalities are pervasive in our econ economy really changes the basic paradigm that's the center of an analysis. And let me say that problems today are posed not just by the incomplete, imperfect, and asymmetric information in which my earlier work focused, but there are new problems posed by mis- and disinformation. And uh, these are having enormous implications for our economy, including the ability to engage in price discrimination on a massive scale, uh, but also for our politics. And we need to think uh, a lot more about how to regulate and control uh, the use of AI and the multiple mechanisms of mis- and disinformation. And finally, the older literature on externalities and market failures more generally focused on price intervention, going back to the Peruvian tradition. But as we've understood the broad nature of those market failures and what happens when we have multiple market failures, uh, we recognize we have to go beyond price interventions to correct, uh, to get, to get uh, uh, a second and third best optimum. Uh, one needs nonlinear pricing, one needs regulations, which are, can be viewed as a form of nonlinear pricing. Uh, one needs public investment. Modern macroeconomics uh, emphasizes uh, the importance of being built on micro foundations, but one of the problems, it was based on the wrong micro foundations. And uh, that is to say the micro foundations on which it has to be based has to incorporate some of the market failures and perfections of information, financial linkages that I just described. But while the prevailing doctrines are, I think, uh, very problematic, I think recent advances uh, are uh, very promising. Moving away from equilibrium models, which assume stability, assume exogenous shocks, and uh, the main market failure on which attention is focused is wage rigidity. Let me parenthetically emphasize uh, if you think that the only reason markets are not efficient is that there's wage rigidity, there's a political agenda there. Uh, let's get rid of that wage rigidity. Let's lower wages. And so we ought to recognize that often our economics embeds in it a political uh, 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 agenda, which we ought to uh, be uh, more open about. But we're moving away from these models that make, in my mind, absolutely no sense to disequilibrium models with noise, with endogenous shocks, with multiple market failures, especially related to finance, and moving to models that incorporate evolution, adaptation, uh, with endogenous innovation, seem to me uh, a, a really promising direction. Another aspect in which uh, particularly macro models were deficient is the representative agent models, which is by assumption ignored issues of distribution. 
by assumption, they assumed they weren't a poor. And I think uh, as inequality has grown to a level that it cannot be ignored, econo economists are beginning to put distribution more in the center. And that means we have to explain inequality, both uh, inequality in terms of the problem, the distribution of income, but also uh, mobility, analyzing the consequences, uh, the kind of results that many models are now getting that uh, excessive inequality results in poor economic performance, uh, moving away from the framework that uh, was at the center of uh, mid 20th century economics where you, there was the big trade off between equality and economic performance. But as we think again about innovation, we have to, uh, and start thinking about AI, we have to start centering more on questions about how AI will affect inequalities both within and between countries. And that then needs us to focus more on the policies to remedy this. For instance, how to steer innovation. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the rules of the game matter and how do we redesign those rules of the game uh, in order to uh, get uh, uh, more shared prosperity. Um, so let me conclude. Uh, for decades, there has been in economics, a prevailing set of doctrines, a what might be called a conventional uh, wisdom. Uh, while supposedly uh, uh, based on, quote, science, the empirical evidence and, and based on empirical evidence and well-formulated models, much of this conventional wisdom was, uh, might be thought, doctrinal. It ignored evidence to the contrary. Uh, it, we could actually describe it as uh, within frameworks provided by behavioral economics. Uh, the models remarkably didn't examine the robustness of the underlying theories to small changes and assumptions. Uh, one of my, uh, th one of the things I emphasize is how small changes and assumptions about information could have dramatic different effects. But that's true of many of the other assumptions that go into the standard model. And uh, the, uh, 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 the models of the, that have prevailed until quite recently gave short shrift to the critical issues like uh, distribution and uh, the externalities associated with the uh, climate change. Uh, in spite of this, there have been important strands of research going uh, in alternative directions and uh, uh, in a, I think in a, in a uh, very positive way, because um, uh, I think we are now uh, in a very good position to bring together these strands to construct uh, an alternative vision, what sometimes being, is now being called, at least in the United States, the post-neoliberal agenda. So I think this is a, a, a very exciting time to uh, start your uh, research institute because I think you're, you, you, you've been actually making many contributions to this, uh, what might call this post-neoliberal agenda. And uh, there's obviously a, a lot more work to be done. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, we will uh, now proceed to um, Professor Yun Shin at the BIS, he has, we're gonna go back, I believe, to uh, a macro lens on international mar markets, and in particular, uh, the role of uh, financial Thank you, flows. Vasco, and, uh, um, and greetings to you all. Uh, and hello, Bill. Um, it's really an honor and privilege to, to join you all to, uh, to celebrate the, the Janeway Institute. And uh, it was especially good to listen to Bill um, in his introductory remarks, um, uh, you know, on the complex interactions between the real economy and the financial markets. Um, so I guess you know one way of characterizing that is uh, through the motto: um, "What happens in financial markets doesn't always stay in financial markets. Uh, it has implications for for the real economy as well." Uh, so what I thought I'd do is um, just give you a snippet of some of the uh, sort of frontier work. There's going on. Um, um, it's it's really sort of supplementing what uh, Hélène um, 
uh, told us earlier, but focusing uh, much more on the um, on the emerging markets. Um, so if you look at the the recent past, uh, just you know think back to COVID uh, and the policy response. Uh, fiscal policy has really led the way in the policy response uh, to the pandemic. And uh, what it's done is, of course, it's, it's, it's given rise to very large budget deficits, uh, both in advanced and in, in um, emerging economies. The deficits are larger in the advanced economies because they have more fiscal space. Um, but you can see that the emerging markets had also really used that uh, space really quite aggressively. Now, um, there is one piece of good news here, which is that most emerging markets, at least uh, emerging market governments, have overcome original sin. Uh, so that's the idea that emerging markets, if they want to borrow from foreigners, have to borrow in foreign currency. So this is the, the famous dictum that uh, Eichen Green and Hausman laid out uh, in the 1990s, just in the wake of the of the Asian um, and other emerging market crises uh, you know, back then. But since then, emerging markets have really made remarkable progress in uh, being able to tap global markets in domestic currency. And uh, this is one chart just gives you a, a, a very um, high level view. The pink bars here represent the proportion of government debt that um, is issued in, in domestic currency. It's only the blue that is issued in, in foreign currency. The pink hashed area is the domestic currency debt that is actually held by foreign investors. And that's a pretty substantial portion, as you can see. And um, what's, um, what's really remarkable has been how large that proportion has been. But you can see that um, the shock of COVID and the subsequent uh, cry, uh, and the subsequent slowdown has really um, sort of you know turned the tables back towards the bad old days, as it were. Uh, in that overcoming original sin has not been the panacea uh, in securing policy space, because you know to conduct fiscal policy in the appropriate way, you need to have the resources. Monetary financing, at least in the in the emerging markets, is, is not going to work, um, given uh, you know the the history of um, uh, of financial crisis there. And what this chart shows is that as the pandemic hit and you saw these very large portfolio outflows, um, and here the pink is in foreign currency, the blue is in domestic currency, this is both corporate and sovereign debt. So this is why the pink bars are somewhat larger. Now, whereas the, the foreign currency debt has flowed back, uh, the domestic currency, at least in, in this cumulative uh, um, way, has really not recovered, it has, has only barely recovered uh, their, their previous, uh, um, their previous pre-pandemic uh, levels. And that's also reflected in, of course, the, the yields. And as the red here, um, the red series here shows the dollar yields, and that's, of course, um, uh, come right back, but the blue um, which is the local currency yields has stayed uh, stayed quite high, and it reflects the higher risks in the eyes of the investors, and it's been compounded by the well-known uh, the rolling series of social and political unrest we've seen in several uh, emerging markets as well. So, um, so the focus, I think that uh, um, um, the the one chart that really shows us best is uh, is this one. Um, which shows that um, the share of domestic currency sovereign bonds held by foreign investors has really fallen quite substantially relative to the recent highs. So the black horizontal bars here represent the, the maximum proportion of the domestic currency sovereign bonds held by foreign investors uh, over the, uh, the five years uh, before COVID. Uh, but what you see is that in the latest uh, reading, um, that proportion, those proportions have really shrunk, um, and in some cases quite substantially. And it's a it's another way of showing uh, what we sh uh, what what the previous chart actually showed. And let me just focus on one series of charts, and I'll finish, um, uh, Vasco. So why is it that uh, original sin, overcoming original sin, has not been um, accompanied by 
securing fiscal space. And um, one way to see this is exactly the kind of relationship that uh, Bill mentioned in his opening remarks, which is the relationship between uh, financial conditions uh, and the real economy, but in particular, the uh, relationship between exchange rates and domestic financial conditions. And this is something that, of course, Ellen has also worked very extensively on. So let me just spend a, a few seconds on, on these charts just to orient you on what's going on here. So in these panels, um, the horizontal axis measures the weekly return to the um, JP Morgan government bond index for emerging markets. So these are in percentage points. Um, uh, and so um, on the right-hand side of these panels are the, um, are the states of the world, uh, are representing states of the world when the yields fall and bond prices rise. Left-hand parts are when the yields rise and the and, and returns are negative. The vertical axis measures the same returns, but in dollar terms. So from the point of view of a dollar investor, how does the uh, change in the, uh, the index itself um, um, show up in these, um, in these charts? And you see it in terms of these, um, these uh, scatter charts, where uh, for any uh, percentage return of the local currency index, the, uh, the return in dollar terms are actually steeper. So in those states of the world, when the yields fall, financial conditions are more accommodative, and returns are higher, that's when the dollar returns are higher than the local currency returns. So you win both in terms of the exchange rate and in terms of the, uh, of the bond return itself. In other words, these are states of the world when the dollar is depreciating or the local currency is appreciating. And that's exactly what Ellen was uh, referring to earlier, that it's these states of the world when uh, the domestic currency is appreciating is also um, the, those states of the world where financial conditions are looser. The price to pay, of course, is on the left-hand side, where when the uh, domestic currency depreciates, it's when the dollar returns are actually even lower, uh, represented by the fact that these are the states of the world when the, uh, when the dollar is appreciating, domestic currency is depreciating. And the, and the slope gives you a sense of the sensitivity, if you like, um, and one way to think about this is that the currency mismatch has migrated from the borrowers to the investors, uh, in that the investors are entering these markets on an unhedged basis, <clears throat> and they're bearing the currency risk. So, uh, you know, whereas Eichen Green and Houseman were referring to the currency mismatch on the borrower's balance sheet and the vulnerability that they were facing, what these charts show is that uh, emerging markets have made a great deal of progress in overcoming original sin, but uh, that still leaves the currency mismatch, but the, that currency mismatch has migrated from the borrower's balance sheet to the investor's balance sheet. And it gives rise to these risk on, risk off, um, giving rise to what, um, uh, what you can call the, the duration multiplier in the sense that uh, if it's a five-year bond or a seven-year bond, um, if the slope is, uh, let's say, 2, in the case of Brazil, it's 2.28, then it's as if you're holding a bond that is 10 to 12 years maturity. So it's like uh, holding a much longer maturity bond because the returns are just multiplied by, um, by a multiple that's, that's bigger than 1. Now, if you plot these numbers, so plot the slopes uh, for that scatter chart uh, for each country, we get this kind of ranking here. And you can see that the duration multiplier is hovering uh, around uh, two for large emerging markets. But uh, for some other countries, it's actually much lower. And indeed, uh, for the UK uh, and for Sweden, so I've sort of plotted some advanced economies here for, for comparison. And I've also plotted Chile, which is an interesting case. They're actually um, less than one. So in fact, um, the currency moves tend to you know, buffer. So what can we do about this? Um, well, I think this is where many of the issues that Joe laid out, I think, are still relevant. Um, certainly, uh, the borrowers can still do a lot, so, uh, developing domestic investor bases, uh, funded pensions, 
So I should have, uh, I was looking at, yeah. So let's uh, move to the next one. Um, and uh, of course, hedging markets and the associated infrastructure will be very important as well. Uh, but on the part of the investors, um, something as um, uh, perhaps you know, innocuous as changing the numeraire, you know, may be quite an interesting idea in this context because the reason why um, uh, you can uh, posit this relationship between the exchange rate and financial conditions, and this is exactly um, uh, the work that Elena has also worked on, is precisely because of the endogenous reaction. And this is exactly what uh, Bill had in mind um, uh, when he uh, 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 you know, presented his views on this. Now, what if you, by changing the numeraire, also uh, were able to change the behavior? Uh, and I think here are some, um, some um, alternative indices may actually have uh, some value. So here, if you plot the euro duration multipliers alongside the dollar duration multipliers, you can see that the euro duration multipliers are actually lower. So if you're an investor who is evaluating um, the returns in euro terms, that kind of um, you know wind chill factor in the returns uh, when you combine exchange rate changes as well as the uh, the the underlying returns will actually be somewhat mitigated. Now, of course, um, if you change something, that will change the behavior, which will change the equilibrium outcome. And so this, uh, you know, this calculation here is not going to be what you will actually see um, as a result uh, when everything settles down. But at least in the comparative statics, you, you, know, you could uh, see that this uh, um, effect might actually uh, help the emerging markets in that context. So here uh, is a comparison of the dollar and the yen duration multipliers. And I'll end with the dollar and uh, sterling duration multiplier. Uh, so if you're a sterling-based investor and you calculate your return in, in, in sterling terms, it's really the, uh, it's the purple um, uh, um, diamond that, uh, you know, that would be relevant. So I thought I would just share this with you. It uh, is an intersection of some things that policymakers are very focused on. Uh, it's something uh, that's very key to financial markets. And I thought it was a very useful way to illustrate, uh, if you like, the, the organizing um, idea of the Janeway Center and some of the work that uh, Bill has, has done over the years uh, in showing the importance of the link uh, between uh, financial markets and the real economy. So let me finish there, Vasco. Thank you very much, Yun. Um, so we had two speakers going, having an inward look, a methodological look to the profession, two speakers, uh, choosing to elect um, real world development as kind of uh, to frame the evolution of, of thinking along their margins. So it is also obvious that all speakers uh, unanimously went over there a lot of time. <laughs> so we have less time, much less time than expected to have a second round among speakers. And I would really want to get questions from the audience, both here and uh, anyone that may be following us online. Um, so I would start going around the room to see if there is any questions to our panelists and, um, and, and go from there, or indeed from our online audience. Bill, not surprisingly, goes first. Um, <clears throat> this is to take the conversation a little bit further because I certainly, as you will have heard, applaud the new directions that Joe mentioned, that Elaine mentioned, and that Hyun indirectly alluded to in research. But the question I have is, so how do we get this into the curriculum? How do we get these new approaches, these breaking away from the standard model at micro and macro, domestic, international, into both the, the graduate and also the, the, the undergraduate curriculum? And to what extent do you think that is happening or that it can happen? Is anyone? Why, why don't, doesn't Joe take that one? Joe, do you want to? Joe, do you want to start? Joe, do you want to start? OK, let me, let me make a, uh, just one comment. There, there is a. Uh, a uh, uh, important uh, educational project called CORE, uh, 
that many economists have been involved in in uh, the introductory uh, textbook, and and uh, I think hopefully they hope to go beyond that. Uh, and it's also interesting because it's uh, uh, provided uh, free textbook as opposed to uh, charging uh, a high price for it. It has a, a certain uh, alternative mo business model behind it. Uh, but I think it's been struggling to uh, actually change some of the uh, basic uh, teachings and uh, it's being used very extensively in the UK less so in the United States, but I think it's been actually relatively successful uh, in the UK. Um, I think that uh, uh, one has to, in the end, convert the teachers because uh, the teachers have to believe in what they're teaching. And so I, I think part of the job is, is uh, you know, in, in many ways, uh, uh, the world has helped us. Uh, the 2008 crisis, the pandemic, the climate change, and the inequality crisis have all helped uh, bring to the fore problems that the standard model didn't deal with uh, well. And uh, the good news is I think uh, many economists that found that the tools that they had taught were, could be adapted to address these issues uh, once the question had been well posed. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Elen Yun, do you want to jump in and any thoughts on the question? Go ahead. So, uh, absolutely. So, uh, I uh, second the fact that the, for example, that project is, uh, you know, uh, taking hold in the UK, also in France, by the way, there are people who, are, who use it <laughs> and who have collaborated with it. Uh, and in general, so, I, well, I don't teach undergrads uh, being in a business school, but certainly, you know, at the graduate level, uh, the PhD level, uh, you know, we do teach uh, this kind of frontier, um, frontier research, which, uh, by the way, is a lot more, indeed, tends to be a lot more realistic. Uh, we, there's the data revolution where people are a lot more careful about trying to confront their theories with the real world, and I think that's really much pushing in that direction. And in general, I mean, if we think about all of the, li the literature, which is about psychological biases, et cetera, it's a lot of fun for students. <laughs> so uh, indeed, um, I think we are, there is some movement and, um, and certainly it's, uh, it's very welcome. Okay, thank you. Is there- Yeah, any... Bill, I think what I would also add to that is that um, uh, uh, as, um, as Joe also said, in the spirit of changing the teachers, what we certainly see um, at the leading conferences um, is that the agenda has really changed um, you know, uh, quite substantially from, uh, from the kind of agenda we, we used to see before the crisis. And uh, topics like uh, banking, topics like um, capital flows and, uh, and, the, uh, and uh, financial crises, dynamics and so on, they're really now very mainstream. So um, I think in some ways um, that progress has, has already been made. And uh, the thinking I think has percolated actually or, um, to, the, to the, I mean, certainly in the PhD programs, uh, but perhaps less so in the undergraduate programs. Um, but um, I think, uh, you know, there has been quite a substantial progress, at least um, now I'm a little bit further away from, from um, uh, from frontline teaching. But Vasco, I think you can also vouch for these things. Um, I mean, you're really much more at the cutting edge. Uh, but Bill, I think, uh, you know, you can be, um, I think you, know, you can be happy that, you know, things are changing and, uh, um, and, the, and the debate is actually moving on. Thank you both. Thank you all three. Are there any other questions in the room? Okay, I, I just wanna, we, we've had a, a question from our online audience and they are pointing to something that uh, surfaced uh, in different ways across speakers, which is some movement about um, re-understanding macro as, as kind of 
a properly aggregated uh, micro with all its uh, micro details and micro frictions. So, and this this shows up in in the world. You know, when when Elen was talking about uh, interdependencies and aggregation uh, in some of Joe's remarks regarding how do we think about macro beyond the represented firm. So I would like to kind of elicit a few panel, a few, the panel to, to, to discuss a little bit about the movement in macro away from, from these kind of single uh, representative agents and, and then integration and what, it, what that integration with micro and with new micro series of frictions and of decisions can, can look like and, and what their view is on the current move that is clearly in the profession, uh, that has taken hold in the profession. Well, let me begin uh, with just a few, a uh, couple of remarks. First of all, the representative, <clears throat> in a representative agent model, uh, by definition, there can't be inequality. Uh, and if there were any equality, it wouldn't make any difference. Also, there can't be financial markets uh, because uh, uh, who is going to borrow from whom? Uh, you're borrowing from yourself. And that's not a very interesting financial market. So there can't be really interesting financial markets. Thirdly, uh, something, a topic that I'm very obviously sensitive about, there can't be asymmetric information unless individuals suffer from schizophrenia. Uh, because uh, obviously uh, with only one person, uh, he knows uh, all that there is. There can't be a separation between firms and households because firm is nothing but the household. So the key point that Keynes emphasized that there's a separation of savings and investment, uh, that doesn't exist. The issues of corporate governance don't exist. So um, the representative agent model takes out everything that's interesting, I think, in uh, macroeconomics. But I want to highlight one thing in particular that is rel was relevant, uh, uh, shown in the pandemic, shown in the uh, 2008 crisis, that uh, average numbers don't reflect what happens to large portions of the population. So before the 2008 crisis, there were people, I won't name them, who said, don't worry about uh, all the household debt because uh, mortgages, because on average, there is a lot of net worth in the household sector. The total value of housing exceeded the total value of housing debt by a large margin. Yes, well, that's true, but that didn't ask the question if 20% of homeowners are have no uh, equity or very little equity in their house, a small change in the price of housing puts them underwater. And that leads to defaults, foreclosures, and massive economic interruptions. So that's just one example of how by um, how distributions, in this case, the distribution of, of uh, uh, different disparities in uh, between the value of, of uh, indebtedness and the value of the houses differing across uh, the population uh, lead to markedly different macroeconomic uh, consequences. Uh, there was a much older literature on the difficulties of aggregation, uh, which has been totally lost uh, and I think uh, it might be good actually to uh, bring back some of that more careful thought about what are the circumstances in which we can engage in aggregation and realize that, that we can't, you know, a representative bank doesn't capture the financial sector. Uh, we, we would not have had the kind of impact of Lehman Brothers going down if there were only one bank in our economy. A representative of a household doesn't connect, uh, represent financial fragility, and uh, one can go down the list. So that uh, when I talk about inequality, it's not just 
inequality because of my concerns about uh, uh, well disparities and well being, and it's about how the economic system uh, behaves. Thank you, Joe. I think uh, Elaine already uh, started yeah. talking about this during our talk, so I, I guess she she can she can follow up. So, Vasco, maybe I can just say a word um, following yeah. Joe. Um, uh, I think micro foundations, I think, uh, um, are very important. Uh, the issue um, is really how, and uh, you know, what kind of micro foundations uh, you know would uh, be seen as um, as passing the bar. Um, and I think here um, uh, our macro colleagues have uh, made considerable progress, um, you know, through through these heterogeneous agent models and so on. But on the other side, um, I think it's also worth saying that sometimes the drilling up is just as important as drilling down, in that uh, it actually forces you to think about the accounting, underlying accounting uh, identities, uh, which I think are very important, especially in the international context. So to give you, you know, a, in a in a very short, uh, um, in a in a very short expression, if you um, if you already start with the GDP area as your unit of account, you're more or less um, uh, locked into thinking about uh, uh, the international e um, economy th through the aggregation of individual countries' GDP aggregates. And then the balance of payments uh, uh, come in very much as the balance between uh, GDP areas uh, and so on. And uh, especially exchange rates uh, become the uh, the relative prices across GDP areas, um, but um, you know as as Alem was showing in some of her graphs, um, uh, the financial system doesn't really conform to that picture at all, and um, sometimes the overlaps uh, between the different categories are such that uh, it only makes sense if you actually drill up to the top and uh, work from global aggregates. And I think here, uh, you know, Elena has done some really path breaking work on. Um, on global financial cycles, which I think uh, um, has really, um, you know, shifted the needle, has really moved the needle on uh, the, the, you know, debates in this area. And I would say that, uh, Bill, I think this is another example of how the debate, um, you know, in our profession has actually changed. All right. I think that's a perfect cue for you, Alain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I... I... Uh, I second what my uh, um, brilliant colleagues here uh, say about the, the need for heterogeneity, of course. I would just point out that depending on what one is interested about, effectively, it's, uh, you have to identify the right type of heterogeneity. So indeed, for financial stability, one could be heterogeneity in risk-taking abilities, for example, or, or, or depending on your either regulatory or uh, incentives uh, and uh, your degree of liability. Uh, you, you may have different heterogeneity in ability to take risk. If you're looking about um, uh, heterogeneity, uh, which is relevant for, uh, for example, climate change policy, then there, there's a relevant uh, uh, cut of the data, which is going to be completely different. It's going to be uh, uh, households which are in very cyclical industries, who are stuck with their cars in uh, the rural countryside, etc. And, and you want to, uh, uh, to, to think about uh, uh, the households which are very constrained when the price of uh, fuel is going to go up because of our policies, etc. So uh, you have to really tailor uh, the heterogeneity to the main issue at hand. This is in theory quite complicated already because you also have to understand uh, what, the what are the right mechanism, the way they play out. Uh, each time we introduce heterogeneity, it becomes obviously very much more complicated. Uh, and also you want to make use, I think, of a new ability. We have to process a lot of data. Uh, and so, but you should not forget about the theory at the same time. So I think this is a little bit our challenge going forward. We have a lot of data. We learn a lot of new things about the world. We should be a lot uh, more refined in terms of granularity because of that. At the same time, we have to understand the, under the relevant underlying economic mechanisms. And, uh, and that's where uh, a lot of the new work is, uh, is trying to make some progress, I think. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we're 
already behind, uh, behind our schedule. So I think I'll, uh, if there are no burning questions in the room, I will bring this to a close and, and thank our fantastic panelists for their uh, insights and view and input into the Janeway Institute. And please do come whenever you're around. We're open doors. Bye-bye. Thank you.